What you're about to see and hear exists in reality in Jamaica and has become one of the many unfortunate chapters. After accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Greetings, massive. Wagwan, Jamaica. The third industrial revolution began in the 1950s, and I want, I want to capture your attention here. With the development of digital systems, communication, and rapid advances in computing power, which have enabled new ways of generating, processing, and sharing information. But I want you to just reflect that when the world had moved on to the third industrial revolution, Jamaica was just starting to see the benefits from the second industrial revolution. What happened in the 50s? That is when we started to develop bauxite, tourism. We started to have greater development in our agriculture. We started to have greater expansion in our infrastructure. But by then, the world had moved on. In other words, the information age had begun. But I'm about to make a point because it's a point that has to be made. Again, Jamaica missed out on this era of global development. Though it could be argued that during this period, Jamaica saw significant investments in bauxite, tourism, agriculture, and infrastructure that would see us having great prospects similar to that of Singapore had we stayed the course coming out of the creditable economic base of the 60s and 50s, and had we kept our focus on our economic independence. The departure from course during this period of industrialization and industrial development was not due to external forces. It was due to the misadventure of the PNP which diverted us from the path of economic growth, selling the people of Jamaica false hope and unrealistic dreams for which the country is still paying today. Those countries that were not distracted from the path of economic development and maintained a steady and balanced course, managed to align their education systems and their economies to take advantage of the opportunities of industrialization, even if they were lagging behind at the time of the third industrial revolution. So countries like Singapore and South Korea who were both very poor, indeed South Korea was much poorer than Jamaica, at the time of the third industrial revolution, they were just industrializing on the second wave of industrialization, but they stayed the course. Instead, we had a flirtation with ideologies that were foreign to us and did not serve us well. And there's a very important point. This is not a lecture, and I'm therefore just partially delivering the speech I had prepared. Because, as I said, this is not a lecture, but it's a point that should be made. That had we stayed the course with all the social problems that needed to be addressed, had we stayed the economic course and ensured that our economy was aligned to the opportunities that were created by the industrial transformations that were taking place, Jamaica would be better place today. Which, after accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. What you're about to see and hear exists in reality in Jamaica and has become one of the many unfortunate chapters in our young history. Every source of information was found in the public domain, 
and represents only the truth as it exists. Corruption in its various forms is a serious threat to the social order and the rule of law. Corrupted peoples are really criminals. Corruption starts at the head of our government system and comes right down. You know, the governance part, that's where most of the problem lies within the country, you know. You're corrupt in such a way that you can't say nothing. If you say something, you're going to get where the dog get. Frankly speaking, as a joke. We know everybody corrupt. Jamaica corrupt. And the whole of them corrupt. The whole of them corrupt. You know, and who know who is one of the main reasons for corruption? We are a corrupt society in so many ways. We maim, harm, and kill each other too quickly and for no good reason. The film you are about to see is about a matter of major and growing concern amongst the Jamaican people from all walks of life, of every political persuasion, and as well, concern to our friends in the international community. It is about the costs of corruption to Jamaica and to each and every Jamaican. We are truly proud as Jamaicans of our achievements since independence, but we could have achieved so much more had we brought corruption more under control. I am Professor Trevor Munro, Head of National Integrity Action, and in the next hour, you're going to be hearing from experts dealing with different episodes of corruption that have bedeviled our country and our progress over the last 40 years. Oh, do I think Jamaica is a corrupt place? Yes, it is. Yeah, very corrupt. Transparency International gives Jamaica a ranking of 3.3 .3 out of 10, where the closer you get to zero, the more corrupt you are. And I'm actually arguing that Jamaica, in Jamaica, corruption is the norm. Corrupted peoples are really criminals. So, same way as how you define the criminals, the same way you should define corruption. Where is the money going? What are you doing with all these monies? But many people have reported that the experience of low-level corruption has diminished considerably in recent years. So what the score probably reflects is the continued existence of high-level corruption, which really reflects the way that our political system is still contaminated by links with organised crime. I think the government needs to be more interactive with the people of the country. I think they need to know what people want for the country and not just decide for them. In reality, if it was the lower level end persons only in the corruption, I mean, that could have been dissolved a long time. Because the higher level would come in and brute force that. See, if, if the king is corrupt, then his soldiers are going to be corrupt and his followers are going to be corrupt. I'm not saying the government is corrupt, but I'm saying it is coming from the top end level. Corruption starts at the head of our government system and comes right down. So it's not, I, I can't comment on corruption because not that I'm not aware of it, I know that it exists, but where it starts from, where it comes from, I cannot tell you. My particular concern is the complicity of government and those who are in political leadership and what they should do differently and how they allow things to go by and even contribute to a public office being misused. We have never really go forward with actually prosecuting someone of status with these laws and I think that is really what perpetuates the crime of corruption, you know. I feel corruption is not a small man or a big man issue. It's an everybody thing. We are supposed to look into it. You understand me? Right now, you're having two politicians. You have JLP and PNP. And the whole of them corrupt. The whole of them corrupt. At the political level, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and people that speak to you off the record about wanting to do investments in Jamaica, whether local investors or foreign investors, and, and feeling that either being outrightly asked to pay um, for services, or, or feeling that because they were unwilling to, then whatever ideas they had did not get to the top of the chain. <laughs> 